Hello everyone and welcome to our talk on chirality and biologically active molecules. So as we said, um, chiral molecules and stereochemistry are really important to your body um, and so we're just going to talk more about why that is. So when we talk about chirality, your body should be the first thing that comes to mind. As we said, chirality um, comes from the word chiral, which actually came from um, hands. So your hands are chiral, your ears are chiral, different parts of your body are chiral. But you may not know this, but your um, microscopic um, things are also somewhat chiral, depending on the molecule. So one thing that we know to be chiral is the amino acids. So your amino acids, the ones that are active in your body are all L amino acids. They have a particular stereochemistry. So I've shown it on the right. Um, as you can see, you've got the amino part on the left, you've got the carboxylic acid part on the right, and then you have got this thing coming down. Well, it turns out this thing coming down to the side chain, that's what makes amino acids different. So if you have glycine or alanine, um, that's going to change the side chain. Um, but then it's always going to be, relative to these other things, it's going to be going away from you. And that also means that there will be a hydrogen coming towards you. Because it's a chiral center, it should have four things attached, and it does. So because the building blocks of your proteins are all have chiral centers, that means that your proteins overall are probably going to have some chirality or some specific stereochemistry. And that's what we find to happen. We find that enzymes and receptors are both chiral because they're made of proteins. Um, and that means that their substrates also have to be chiral. The substrate is just the thing that goes into the enzyme or into the receptor and makes it do its particular response. So an example that we have of this, of um, different chirality, is for smells. So we have these molecules here. The molecules shown are both called limonene. If you look, they have all the same connectivity, all the same functional groups. The only difference is the chiral center here at the bottom. So in one case, it's going back away from you, and the other case, it's going towards you. So what we find is for the structure on the left, that has a smell of oranges, according to how it fits in your nose receptors. But whenever you have the enantiomer, which is the one on the right, that actually smells like turpentine. Or some people think it smells like lemon, but apparently the popular consensus is it smells like turpentine. Um, but it does have limonene because it has a fresh citrus scent. So if they were mixed together, it might smell more lemony. But generally, if you separate these, they have a different scent. Generally in nature, um, if you have a chiral molecule, it tends to only form one version of that chiral molecule. But in this case, you actually have both can be produced naturally. They're not usually produced as a mixture. There's um, different plants and things that can make the left version and the right version. And also an interesting fact is that we use both of these molecules for commercial uses. So the one on the left is used in orange cleaners and the one on the right is actually used as an alternative to turpentine. It will um, remove things like turpentine well. So based on what we just said about enzymes being chiral and preferring a chiral substrate that fits better in the binding site, you would assume that drugs would be chiral, and you'd be partially right. Drugs that are made to be one enantiomer are actually very effective. The problem is making one enantiomer is really expensive. Most drugs that you purchase at the store are actually made by chemical companies, and before that they're made by um, pharmaceutical companies which engineer the steps that you need, the reactions that you need to make a particular molecule. Then industry people try to make it more efficient so they can make it in large batches and make it be cost effective. The problem with getting a specific enantiomer is you need several things. You're either going to need some chiral reagents to make this thing so that the pieces themselves are chiral, or you can make it where it's a mixture of both enantiomers, but then you have to have a way to separate it, and then you have to use chiral chromatography, which we saw in the lab, chromatography actually separates compounds based on their properties. The problem is for chiral chromatography, you have to buy something chiral to put on that column or whatever you're using to make it work. So because of this, most drugs are sold as a racemic mixture. A racemic mixture is just a mix of 50% R and 50% S enantiomer. So it's just an equal mixture of those two things. And basically that's easy to get from any reaction. It doesn't have to be chiral. You're just going to get that. The other nice thing about it is that a racemic mixture can be easily traced because it has a zero optical rotation. While there's no doubt that the pharmaceutical companies do racemic mixtures to save money, let's talk about whether or not this is a problem to the consumer. For most drugs, the answer is going to be no. It's not a problem to have it be a racemic mixture. So for example, ibuprofen is sold as a racemic mixture. Ibuprofen, as you probably know, is an analgesic and an antipyretic, 
and an anti-inflammatory. So you can take it for um, inflammation if you get an injury. You can take it to reduce fevers. Um, you can do it to relieve pain. You can do it for all those reasons. But it's actually the S enantiomer is far more active than the R enantiomer. That doesn't mean that the R enantiomer doesn't do anything. It just means that it's not as active. So having that extra R is not really hurting you. Um, the only thing it means is that you're going to have to take slightly more um, dosage-wise than you would if it was the pure S enantiomer. So it's also true that you can get the S enantiomer, the pure form, um, if you purchase it and you get it prescribed to you. So if you have like severe pain or something and you need it for a specific reason or you need a low dosage for a reason, they could prescribe just the um, S enantiomer and you can buy that. It's just more expensive. So let's look at another example. This one is for anesthetics. The anesthetics that we're going to talk about are listed here. As you can see, the names are kind of hard to pronounce. I may pronounce them wrong, but I'm going to try. So we have bupivacaine, levobupivacaine, and ropivacaine. So hopefully that's right. It's probably a little bit off, but that's okay. So up here I've drawn the structure of the R and the S of the bupivacaine. And as you can see, um, one's it's just got one chiral center here, and this one's wedged, and this one's dashed. Um, but what we're going to compare is the racemic version, the S version alone, and then we're going to compare this ropivacaine. Ropivacaine is actually a homolog to the S bupivacaine. So if you look, a homolog means it's just slightly different. It's almost the same. It just has usually a different number of carbons is what it is. So can you guys see where the carbons are different? Right, if you look on this nitrogen on the right, it's got a slightly shorter chain and then the one on the left has a slightly longer chain. So let's see some of the properties of these, these different things, the racemic, the pure S, and then the ropivacaine, which is the homolog. So the first thing we know is that the racemic mixture of bupivacaine is actually the most potent. It's more potent than just the S alone. That would imply that probably the R is the more potent factor, but um, that's not what the study talked about. It just talked about the racemic. So that's actually the most potent version. But if we look at the S alone, the S is moderately potent. It still works. And it actually has a longer sensory block than the racemic extradural does. So that implies that it's probably taking longer once it gets in the enzyme. It takes longer for it to be released because it doesn't fit quite right. Sometimes that means it will stay in the enzyme actually longer, blocking either receptors or the enzyme that it's working on. Um, this is, works as a moderate femoral nerve block, so it's a pretty common thing to block feeling to your legs, I'm guessing femoral. Um, so that's how that works. So then if you look at the homolog, the homolog is actually less potent. For the homolog, it has less motor block than the racemic does, and also is it still works um, as a moderate femoral nerve block. It's just not as potent as the S original molecule of the bupivacaine. Now, your question may be, if we already knew the most potent was racemic, why did anyone bother to make these? Well, the downside of the racemic mixture is it's highly toxic. Out of all three of these molecules, um, this is the most toxic and has a 50% higher toxicity than the S um, of bupivacaine alone. So again, it's probably the R, the thing that makes it more potent, is also the problem that's making it more toxic. The thing that's most likely to happen is that you're going to have a cardiac collapse and then they won't be able to resuscitate you. So if you're in a cardiac collapse and they can't bring you back, that's a really bad situation to be in. So no one's going to use their racemic pivacaine. It's not like ibuprofen where it's like, oh, it's just fine. You'll take more. You would not take more. You would basically be possibly injured or die. So no one's going to take the racemic version. So that's why they tried to find other ways for it to work. So the first thing they tried was to just take a, the enantiomer that's less dangerous and see what the results were. And this is what they found. So they found that just the S bupivacaine by itself without the R um, is still moderately toxic. You're moderately likely to um, be able to be resuscitated so in this situation, you're moderately likely to be able to be resuscitated if you have a cardiac collapse. Again, it's better than the racemic mixture, but that's still not ideal. You don't want to just be like, maybe you'll come back. You want to have a pretty good chance of coming back. So then if you look at the homolog, you can see why that might be the better option. So as you can see here, the homolog is the least toxic. You're the most likely to be able to be resuscitated from a cardiac collapse. So this would be the ideal as far as the side effects go. Um, still, it's not as potent, so you're going to have that problem. So as with any drug, it's always going to be a balance between getting the thing you want and managing the side effects. So if the side effects are um, 
really dangerous, obviously you're not going to do that. But if it's something where the situation was dangerous, if you didn't have the longer sensory block, then you might want to choose the middle one. But if it's like, well, you need it, but it's not that big a deal. And also, you know, you don't want to die. You would definitely use the homolog on the right, the ropivacaine. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, this is just an example, but there's lots of different kinds of factors that go into making and designing drugs. And this just gives you an example of the difference between making it um, racemic, specifically a chiral drug, or a homolog. Now you know what homolog is. So hopefully that was helpful. Let's look at one more example of a classic chiral drug. So we've seen a few examples, but um, I would be remiss if I didn't show you one of the most commonly cited examples when people talk about chiral drugs. Basically, this is a drug that made people realize like, oh, it might actually matter if the drug is chiral as opposed to racemic. So sometime a little bit before the 1950s, um, thalidomide was discovered to work as a sedative. I'm sure you've all heard of the FDA and know that the FDA works to keep drugs um, so that you have to test them before you put them on the market. So thalidomide had been tested in animals to work as a sedative, and it had been tested in humans, and then they found that it was safe and had minimal side effects, and so it was great. It was a sedative. So then they decided to market it in the 1950s as a really popular morning sickness drug because it sort of reduced that feeling of queasiness, and they thought everything was great. The problem was this drug was actually developed in Germany where they don't have the FDA and they had either not tested it with pregnant women or the results had been suppressed. So what you find is that only the S enantiomer, not the R, causes birth defects. And you can look up thalidomide babies online. Um, it was a whole epidemic in, around that time because a whole bunch of people took it and didn't know. And basically the children were born with um, their limb development was severely altered in a very, very tragic way. Um, and they basically didn't have, their arms didn't grow to full length. They still had hands and feet, but then they just didn't have full length arms and legs. And so they weren't able to be fully mobile. They weren't able to like grab things with their arms. And it was really tragic. And so you could read more about the history of that. But basically it was an example of like, wow, it actually matters which enantiomer you have and that um, racemic's not always okay. In most cases, racemic's not a problem, but this was just a very tragic example when it was a really, really big problem. And so what they've done is that thalidomide is still used for some cases and they've done some studies. So they found like maybe we could just take the S enantiomer away and that way we don't have to worry about that one and we'll just give people the R enantiomer. But what they found through studies is that your body can metabolize and turn the R into the S. So basically it means this drug would never be safe to be given to a woman that's pregnant or a woman who could become pregnant. So um, that's generally a side thing you'll see on certain drugs and this is one of those. So it can be used but not for women or pregnant women um, or women who could be pregnant and they also use it for animals um, for some anesthetics so you can see like if you look it up there's some usage for that so just an interesting example that I think sort of sticks it in your brain like wow enantiomers can be really really different and that's why it's really important that we have the FDA to study these things and keep a lookout for everyone so they're not getting on the mass market and you know causing a whole generation of, of a bunch of kids that are really deformed in a, in a terrible way so that's that story so basically, that's all I have to say about chiral drugs. Hopefully you found this interesting um, and it made sense like how important chiral things are and it will inspire you to want to learn more about them. And with that, we will end this video. As normal, make sure that you check Blackboard to see if there's any additional activities for today's material.